week's language arts lessons. Go ahead and please take out your language arts notebooks, turn to a clean sheet, name today's date. Let's go ahead and uh, go over our objective today. I can explain how Hilton develops different characters' perspectives and analyze how and why characters' perspective changes in response to plot events. Today, we're going to be reading Chapter 6 of the book, The Outsiders. And in a Google Doc, I want you to answer the following two questions. Number one, how does the author foreshadow the fire? And number two, what effect do you think the fire will have on the plot events going forward? In this chapter, we're going to be dealing with a fire. Now, I don't know if you've been catching on to as we've been reading, but there has been talk of a fire. And let's go ahead and read now chapter 6 and see how this all plays out. Chapter 6. Johnny gagged and I almost dropped my hot fudge sundae. Cherry? We both said at the same time. The sock? Yeah, Dally said. She came over the vacant lot the night 2-bit was jumped. Shepard and, uh, Shepherd and some of his outfit and us were hanging around there when she drives up in her little old stingray. That took a lot of nerve. Some of us was uh, some of us some of us was for jumping her then and there, her being the dead kid's girl and all. But two bits stopped. Man, next time I want a broad, I'll pick up my own kind. Yeah, Johnny said slowly, and I was wondering if, like me, he was remembering another voice, also tough and just deepened into manhood, saying, "Next time you want a broad, pick up your own kind." It gave me the creeps. Dally was going on. She said she felt like the whole mess was her fault, which it was, and that she'd keep up keep up with what was uh, coming off with the socks and the rumble and would testify that the socks were drunk and looking for a fight and that you fought back in self-defense. He gave a grim laugh. That little scal sure does hate me. I offered to take her over to the dingo for a coke and she said no thank you and told me where I could go in very polite terms. She was afraid of loving you, I thought. So Cherry Valance, the cheerleader, Bob's girl, the sock, was trying to help us. No, it wasn't Cherry the sock who was helping us. It was Cherry the dreamer who watched sunsets and couldn't stand fights. It was hard to believe a sock could help us, even a sock that dug sunsets. Dally didn't notice. He had forgotten about it already. Man, this place is out, man, this place is out of it. What do they want to what do they do for kicks around here? Play checkers? Dally surveyed the scene without interest. I ain't never been in the country before. Have you two? Johnny shook his head, but I said, Dad used to take us all hunting. I had been I had been the country before. How'd you know about the church? I got a cousin that lives around here somewhere. It's tipped me off that it'd make a, a tough hiding hideout in case of something. Hey, pony boy, I heard you was the best shot in the family. Yeah, I said, Dally, Derry always got most ducks, though. Him and Dad, Soda, and I goofed around too much. Scared off most our game anyway. I couldn't tell Dally that I hated to shoot things. He thinks I was soft. That was a good idea. I mean, cutting your hair and bleaching it. They printed your descriptions in the paper, but you sure wouldn't fit them now. Johnny had been quietly finishing his fifth barbecue sandwich, but now, he announced, we're going back and turning ourselves in. It was Dally's turn to, to gag. Then he swore a while. Then he turned to Johnny and demanded, what? I said we're going back and turning ourselves in. Johnny repeated in a quiet voice. I was surprised, but not shocked. I had thought about turning ourselves in a lot of times, but apparently the whole idea was a jolt to Dallas. I got a good chance of, uh, of being let off easy, Johnny said desperately, and I didn't know if it was Dally he was trying to convince or himself. I ain't got no record with the fuzz, and it ain't no self-defense. Ponyboy and Cherry can testify to that. I don't aim to stay in that church all my life. There was quite a speech for Johnny. His uh, big black eyes grew bigger and, than ever at the thought of going to the police station. For Johnny had death had a deathly fear of cops, but he went on. We won't we won't tell tell that you helped us, Dally, and we won't give won't give you back the uh, and we'll give you back the gun and what's left of the money and say we hitchhiked back with you so we won't get in trouble. Okay? Jolly was toying on the corner. Of the, Jolly was chewing on the corner of his ID card, which gave his age as 21, so he could buy liquor. You sure you want to go back? Us greasers get it worse than anybody else. Johnny nodded, I'm sure. It ain't fair for Ponyboy to stay up in that church with, da with Derry and Soda worrying about him all the time. I don't guess, he swallowed and looked, and, and tried not to look eager. I don't guess my parents are worried about me or anything. The boys are worried, Dally said in a matter-of-fact voice. Two-Bit was going to Texas to hunt for you. 
My parents, Johnny repeated dodgily, did they ask about me? No, snapped Dally. They didn't. Blast it, Johnny. What, what do they matter? Shoot, my old man didn't give me a, get, didn't give me a hang whether, I, I'm in, whether I'm in jail or dead in a car rack or drunk in a gutter. That didn't bother me none. Johnny didn't say anything, but he stared at the dashboard with such hurt bewilderment that I could have bawled. Dally cussed him under his breath and nearly tore out the, transit, the transmission of a T-bird as we roared out of the Dairy Queen. I felt sorry for Dally. He didn't mean it when he said he didn't care about his parents, but he and the rest of the gang knew Johnny cared and did everything they could to make it up to, uh, to make it up to him. I don't know what they I did, I don't know what it was about Johnny. Maybe that lost puppy look and those big eyes that were what made everyone his big brother. But they couldn't, no matter how the hell they try, take the place of his parents. I thought about it for a minute. Derry and Soda Pop were my brothers, and I love both of them. And even if Derry scared me. But not even Soda could take Mom and Dad's place. They were my real brothers, not just adopted ones. No wonder Johnny was hurt because his parents didn't want him. Dally couldn't take it. Dally was of the breed that couldn't take anything. Because he had a hard because he was hard and tough, and when he wasn't, he could turn hard and tough. Johnny was a good fighter and could play it cool, but he wasn't sensitive, and that isn't a good way to be when you're a greaser. Blast it, Johnny, Dally gro growled as he flew along the red road. Why didn't you think of turning yourself in five days ago? It would have saved you a lot of trouble. I was scared, Johnny said with conviction. I still am. He ran his finger down one of, the, of his short black sideburns. I guess we ruined our hair for nothing, pony boy. I guess so. I was glad we were going back. I was sick of that church. I didn't care if I was bald. Dally was scowling, and from the long and painful experience, I knew better than to talk to him when his eyes were blazing like that. I'd likely not get clobbered over the head. That just that had happened before, just as it had happened to all the gang at one time or another. We rarely fought among ourselves. Dally was the unofficial leader, since he kept his be his head best. So didn't Steve had been best friends since grade school and never fought, and Two Bit just got lazy to argue with anyone. Johnny kept his mouth shut too much to get into arguments, and nobody ever fought with Johnny. I kept my mouth shut too, but Dally was a different matter. It's something. If something beefed him, he didn't. He didn't keep quiet about it. And if you rubbed him in the wrong way, look out. Not even Derry wanted to tangle with him. He was dangerous. Johnny uh, just sat there and stared at his feet. He hated for any one of us to be mad at him. He looked awful sad. Dally glanced at him out of the corner of his eye. I looked out the window. Johnny, Dally said in a pleading high voice, using a tone I had never heard from him before. Johnny, I ain't mad at you. I just don't want you to get hurt. You, you don't know what a few months in jail can do to you. Oh, blast it, Johnny. He pushed his white blonde hair back out of his eyes. You'll get hardened in jail. I just don't want that to happen to you like it happened to me. I kept staring out of the window at the rapid passing scenery, but I felt my eyes getting round. Dally never talked like that. Never. Dally didn't give a Yankee dime about anyone but himself, and he, and he was cold and hard and mean. He never talked about his past or being in jail that way. And if he talked about it at all, it was to brag. And I suddenly thought of Dally. In a jail, being the age of ten, growing, uh, growing up in the streets, would you have rather had me living in a hideout for the rest of my life, always on the run, Johnny asked seriously? If Dally had said yes, Johnny would have gone back to the church without hesitation. He figured Dally knew more than he did, and Dally's words were law. But he never heard Dally's answer, for we had reached the top of Jay Mountain, and Dally suddenly slammed on the brakes and stared. Oh, glory, he whispered. The church was on fire. Let's go see what the deal was, I said, hopping out. For what? Dally sounded irritated. Get back in here before I beat your head in. I knew Dally would have parked the car and catch me before he, he, he could carry out his threat. And Johnny was already out following me, so I figured I was safe. We could hear him cussing us out, but he wasn't mad enough to come after us. There was a crowd at the front of the church, most of the little kids. And I was wondering how they'd gotten there so quickly. I tapped the nearest grown-up. What's going on? Well, we don't know for sure, the man said with a good-natured grin. We were having a school picnic up here, and the first thing we knew, the place was burning up. Thank goodness this is a wet season. The old thing is worthless anyway. Then to the kids, he shouted, Stand back, children. The firemen will be coming. I bet we started it, I said to Johnny. We must have dropped a lighted cigarette or something. And, that, and about that time, a lady came running up. Jerry, some of the kids are missing. They're probably around here somewhere. You can't tell with all this excitement where they might be. No, she shook them. They've been missing for at least half an hour. I thought that you were... They were climbing the hill. They were all froze. Faintly, just faintly, you could hear someone yelling, and it sounded like it was coming from inside the church. 
The woman went white. I told them not to play in the church. I told them. She shook like she was going to start screaming, so Jerry shook, shook her. I'll get them. Don't worry. I, started at, start, I stared at the dead run for the church. I started at a dead run for the church, and the man caught my arm. I'll get him. You kids stay out. I jerked loose and ran. All I could think was, we started it. We started it. We started it. I wasn't about to go through the flaming door, so I slammed a big rock through the window and pulled myself in. I, it was a wonder I didn't cut myself to death, now that I think about it. Hey, pony boy! I looked around, startled. I hadn't realized Johnny had been right behind me all the way. I took a deep breath and started coughing. The smoke filled my eyes and they were, it started watering. Is that guy coming? Johnny shook his head. The window stopped him. Too scared? Nah, Johnny gave me a grin. Too fat. <laughs> I laughed. I couldn't laugh because I was scared I'd, I'd be drowned in smoke. The roar and crackling was getting louder and Johnny shouted the next question. Where are the kids? In the back, I guess. I hollered, and we started stumbling through the church. I should be scared. I thought with an old, detached, detached feeling, but I'm not. The cinders and embers began falling on us, singing and, and smarting like ants. Suddenly, in the red glow and haze, I remember wondering what it was like in a burning ember. And I thought, now I know, it's a red hell. Why aren't I scared? We pushed open the door to the back room and found four or five little kids, about eight years old or younger, huddled in a corner. One of them screaming his head off, and Johnny yelled, Shut up! We're going to get you out! The kid looked surprised and, qu and quit hollering. I blinked myself. Johnny wasn't behaving at all like his old self. He looked over his shoulder and saw that the door was blocked by flames, then pushed open the window and tossed out the nearest kid. I caught one quick look at his face. It was red, marked from the falling embers, and sweat streaked, but he grinned at me. He wasn't scared either. That was the only time I could think of when I saw him without that defeated, suspicious look in his eyes. He looked like he was having the time of his life. I picked up a kid, and he promptly bit me. But I leaned out the window and dropped him as gently as I could, being, being in a hurry like that. A crowd was there. By that time, Dally was standing there. When he saw me scream, For Pete's sake, get out of there. The roof's going to cave in any minute. Forget those blasted kids. I didn't pay any attention although pieces of old roof were crashing down too, too close to her comfort. I snatched up another kid, hoping he didn't bite me, and dropped him without wanting to see if he landed okay or not. I was coughing so hard I could hardly stand up, and I wish I had time to take off Dally's jacket. It was hot. We dropped the last of the kids out of the front of the church, started to crumble. Johnny shoved me toward the window. Get out! I leaned out the window and heard a timber crashing and flames roaring right behind me. I staggered, almost falling, coughing and sobbing for a breath. Then I heard... Johnny screamed, and as I turned to go back for him, Dally swore at me and clubbed me across the back of the head uh, as hard as he, as he could, and I went into peaceful darkness. When I came to, I was being bounced around, and I ached and smarted and wondered dimly where I was. I tried to think about there was a high-pitched screaming going on, and I couldn't tell whether it was inside my head or out. Then I realized it was a siren, the fuzz, I thought dully. The cops had come for us. I tried to swallow a groan and... Wished wildly for soda. Someone with a cold, wet rag was gently sponging off my face. And, I, and a voice said, I think he's coming around. I opened my eyes. It was dark. I was moving, I thought. Are they going to take me to jail? Where, I said hoarsely, not able to get anything else out of my mouth. My throat was sore. I blinked at a strange stranger sitting beside me. But he wasn't a stranger. I'd seen him before. Take it easy, kid. You're in an ambulance. Where's Johnny, I cried, fighting for, uh, frightened at being in this car with strangers. And Dallas, they're in the other ambulance right behind us. Just calm down. You're going to be okay. You just passed out. I didn't either, I said uh, I said in the bored, tough voice we reserved for strangers and cops. Dallas hit me. How come? Because your back was in flames, that's why. I'm surprised. It was? Golly, I didn't feel it. I, I, it don't hurt. We put it out before you got burned. That jacket saved you from being burned. Maybe saved your life. You just uh, you just kneeled over from smoke uh, inhalation and a little shock, of course. That slap on the back didn't help much. I remembered who he was then. Jerry, somebody or other who was too heavy to get in the window. He must be the school teacher, I thought. Are you taking us to the police station? I said, a little mixed up as to what was what what was coming off the police station. It was his turn to be surprised. What well, what would we want to take to the police station for? We're taking all three of you to the hospital. I let his first remark slide. Are Johnny and Dally all right? Which one's which? Johnny has black hair. Dally, the mean-looking one. He studied his wedding ring. Maybe he's thinking about his wife, I thought. I wish he'd say something. 
We think the Toehead kid is going to be all right. He burned one arm pretty badly, though, trying to drag the other out of the kid out of the window. Johnny, well, I don't know about him. A piece of timber caught him across the back. He might have broken his back, and he was burned pretty severely. He passed out before he got to the window. They're, gonna, they're giving him plasma now. He must have seen the look on your face because he hurriedly changed the subject. I swear, you kids are the bra three bravest kids I've seen in a long time. First, you and the black-haired kid climbing through the window, and then the tough-looking kid going back in to save him. Miss O'Brien and I think you were sent straight from heaven. Or are you just professional heroes or something? Saint for, sent from heaven? And he gotten a look at Dallas? We're no, we're greasers, I said. I was too worried and scared to appreciate the fact that he was trying to be funny. You're what? Greasers, you know, like hoods, JDs. Johnny is, uh, is wanted for murder and Dallas has a record with the fuzz a mile long. Are you kidding me? Jerry stared at me as if I thought I was ill in shock or something. I am not. Take me to town and you'll find out pretty quick. We're taking, we're t we're taking you to the hospital there anyway. Do we, the, the address card in your billfold said that this is where you live. Your name's really Pony Boy? Yeah, even in my birth certificate. And don't bug me about it. Are, I felt weak. Are the little kids okay? Just, just fine. A little frightened, maybe. There were some short explosions right after you all got out. Suddenly, just exactly like gunfire. Gunfire. They went, there went our gun, and gone with the wind. Were we sent from heaven? I started to laugh weakly. I guess that guy knew how close to hysterics I really was. For he talked to me in a real slow, soothing voice all the way to the hospital. I was sitting in the waiting room, waiting to hear how Dally and Johnny were. I had been checked over, and except for a few burns and a big bruise across my back, I was all right. I had watched them bring, bring Dally and Johnny in on stretchers. Dally's eyes were closed, but when I spoke, he tried to grin, and had told me that if I ever did that stupid thing like that again, he'd beat the tar out of me. He was still swearing at me when I, he took him on in. Johnny was unconscious. I had been afraid to look at him, but I thought I was relieved to see his face wasn't burned. He just looked very pale and still and sort of sick. I would have cried at the sight of him uh, so still, except I couldn't, couldn't in front of people. The Jerry, the Jerry Wood had stayed with me the whole, the whole, all time. He kept thanking me for getting the kids out. He didn't seem to mind us being hoods. I told him the whole story, starting when Dallas and Johnny and I had met at the corner of Picker and Sutton, and let out the part about the gun and our hitchhiking ride in the freight car. <clears throat> He was real nice about it and said that, that being heroes would help get us out of trouble, especially since it was self-defense and all. I was sitting there smoking a cigarette when Jerry came in from making a phone call. He stared at me for a second. You shouldn't be smoking. I was startled. How come? I took. A, I looked at my cigarette. It looked, it looked okay to me. I looked around for a no-smoking sign. Couldn't find one. How come? Why, uh, Jerry stammered, you're too young. I am. I never thought about it. Everyone in our neighborhood, even the girls, smoked, except for, uh, for Derry, who was too proud of his athletic health to risk a cigarette. We all had started smoking at an early age. Johnny had been smoking since nine. Steve started at 11, so no one thought it usual when I started. I was, uh, I was the weed feed in my family. So does smokes only to steady his nerves or when he wants to look tough. Jerry simply sighed, then grinned. There are some people here to see you, claim to be your brothers or something. I leapt up and ran for the door, but it was already open, and Soda had me in a big bear hug and was swinging me around. I was so glad to see him, and I could have bawled. Finally, he sat me down and looked at me. He pushed his hair back. Oh, pony boy, your hair, your tough hair! Then I saw Derry. He was leaning in the doorway, wearing his olive jeans and black t-shirt. He was still tall, broad-shouldered Derry, but his fists were jammed in his pockets, and his eyes were pleading. I simply looked at him. He swallowed and said in, his, in a husky voice, Pony boy... I let go to Soda and stood there for a minute. Derry didn't like me. He had driven me away that night. He had hit me. Derry hollered at me all the time. He didn't even he didn't even give a hang about me. Suddenly I realized, horrified, that Derry was crying. He didn't make a sound, but tears were running down his cheeks. I hadn't seen him cry in years, not even when Mom and Dad had been killed. I remember the funeral. I had sobbed in spite of myself. Soda had broken down and bawled like a baby, but Derry had only stood there, his fists in his pockets, that look on his face, the same helpless pleading look that he is wearing now. In that second, when what Soda and Derry and Tubit had been trying to tell me came through, Derry did care about me, maybe as much as he cared about Soda, and because he cared, he was trying too hard to make something of me. When he held Pony, 
Where have you been all this time? He meant, Pony, you scared me to death. Please be careful, I, because I couldn't stand if anything happened to you. Derry looked down and turned away suddenly. Suddenly I broke out of my daze. Derry, I screamed. And the next thing I knew, I had him around the waist and was squeezing the daylights at him. Derry, I said, I'm sorry. He was stroking my hair and I couldn't hear the sobs racking him as he fought back his tears. Oh, Pony, I thought we lost you like we had mom and dad. That was his, his silent fear then, of losing another person he loved. I remembered how close he and Dad had been, and I wondered how I could have thought him hard and unfeeling. I listened to his heart pounding through his t-shirt and knew everything was going to be okay now. I had taken the long way around, but I was finally home to stay. So once again, in a Google Doc, you are to answer the following two questions. Number one, what, how does the author foreshadow the fire in the previous chapters? And number two, what effect do you think the fire will have on the plot events going forward? Join me next time when we delve into chapters 7 and 8 of the book, The Outsiders. Keep reading there, 6th graders.